Oh, I got a clink just then. Just then I got a clink. I'm, you know what I'm kind of excited about is after I move, getting a microphone. Yes. Get this one. It's great. I will. Or that or something similar. When I, when I, um, was listening to some of our old audio today, it was fine. My voice was fine, but man, the sound quality is going to improve so much. Yeah. If only we had someone with professional knowledge of sound shit who could perhaps offer opinions when you get to the point of shopping. It's almost like we have one friend who has professional knowledge of sound things and another friend with professional knowledge of podcast recording and editing. (laughs) We are truly blessed. Are we recording? Uh, We are recording. Um, Okay, cool. I will continue drinking my virgin gin and tonic. Is it is a virgin gin and tonic just tonic and lime juice? And some seed lip, but basically, yeah. Okay, okay. It has been an interesting couple of months. Um, our, our dear listeners are able to just listen to these back to back, which is great for them. Or, you know, with maybe a week or two in between. But we have had a time and a half. Yeah. But that's okay. We are here now and we're ready to bag the end of this or whatever they say. <laughs> I'll give you a B minus for that one. Listen. <laughs> um, I would say I'd grade it on a curve, but I never actually understood how curve grading works in school. None of my teachers or professors really ever used it. So it's sort of an abstract concept to me. Laughing in STEM. (laughs) Well, I was laughing in STEM, but also I was laughing because the immediate pun that occurred to me was you can grade these curves. (laughs) (laughs) That gets an Um. A++. (laughs) It gets the best grade. Well, I'm glad that you enjoy my bad puns. I do. It's it's really beneficial considering we have a podcast together that largely consists of puns, tangents, and occasionally talking about the book that we're here to talk about. That's a good combination of things. I think that's what the people want. I think I would hope that that's what the people want. They're here. Um, what are they here for, Sam? The people are here for The Fandom Apprentice, which is a show where you, a very experienced Tolkien nerd, and me, a very fresh-faced angelic youthful Tolkien nerd uh, so much younger than you by two and a half months we'll get together and go over this media that was very important to you growing up but is totally new to me that is it to the letter so we are here I'm Rin I'm the quote-unquote experienced Tolkien nerd oh yeah and we should say our names I'm Sam And we are here with chapters 11 and 12 today of Fellowship of the Ring, which will bring us to the end of the first half of the book, Ah. or to the end of book one, technically. That's another downside of having to wait so long in between recordings in you reading the book. So I've just been sitting around waiting for more Hobbit time, and now I finally get it. Waiting, yeah, waiting right at the end of that, like, horrific cliffhanger where they're all hanging with strider in the end of um chapter 10 strider like, oh, i yeah, hardly know her be... <sighs> <sighs> i didn't make that joke last time but it's had time to marinate Excellent. sorry um actually i'm marinate. not sorry I'm, I'm only sorry for interrupting you i'm not sorry for the joke it marinates in a nice little broth of uh athalas and apples <laughs> It's a really nice healing stew. Mm. Although the puns, I think, undo any healing abilities of the Athalas. Fair. Well, 
we know that danger's coming and shit's getting dark. Um, before we jump into this, do we have anything else we want to bring up or talk about? Nothing that's really pressing and urgent. I have a lot of other random stories and anecdotes about my day and things that have happened in the last several weeks, but I'm sure that relevant anecdotes will come up when they come up. They will. And this is the tangent podcast. We are allowed to go on tangents, but I think we've had enough for the first part of the episode. Yeah, no, I think we're ready to to dive in because there's a lot that happens. Oh my God, these last two chapters are so fucking beefy. Yeah, especially, especially chapter 12. Long. Yeah, chapter 12 especially is really long because I sort of look ahead to see how long it's going to be because I know my own reading pace. And so I'll go, okay, this is 12, 15 pages. I didn't keep track of how long chapter 12 is, but it just kept going and going. We're so used to like the short 10 page chapters from The Hobbit. Mm-hmm. That all of a sudden this is this is so much more. Yeah. But speaking of The Hobbit, we get to go back to the Shire for two pages. Yeah, very briefly. For really terrible shit. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm looking at my notes to see when specifically. That, is that the chapter that we get from the Black Riders perspective? It's not really from the... I wouldn't say it's from their perspective necessarily. It's just like right at the beginning of chapter 11, Knife in the Dark, right? Where we're back in yeah. Dublin. Mm -hmm. And I I read it a couple of times, this line of like, are the Black, the Black Riders are waiting out in front of the house all night. They're just there. Mm -hmm. Like standing there and waiting. And then they finally go in for the kill in like the hour of darkness before dawn. So creepy. Which is so fucking creepy um yeah why not just go as soon as you get there they just um i feel like you know when your your character in skyrim does like you can do the waiting function in skyrim mm -hmm. that's entirely what i imagine is happening is they just hit you know pause and now they're just waiting and time is ticking by hour by hour at a time and mm -hmm. everyone else is just wandering around you like what the fuck amazing um, that was fully what I imagined was going on. But also I, I did sort of think of like, they're definitely, they're watching the house. They're making sure nobody leaves. They're building the, the tension. Mm -hmm. Um, because as any good DM, um, knows it's all, or any good writer or anyone else that deals with creating anticipation knows that's what it's about i'm imagining it essentially like a voice like a stiletto dagger right yeah. designed to slip into armor narrow wickedly sharp but i don't i wouldn't necessarily describe it as thin particularly when he's used that to describe like the effect the ring has on your physicality mm -hmm. thin sort of stretched and we know these creatures are connected to the ring so i suppose you could use that again for their physicality but it implies a sort of weakness and that sort of weakness just doesn't feel menacing to me but i i'm quibbling at tiny little words but that just stood out to me that's interesting and i like that you as the musically inclined and educated person are thinking about the way that things sound in that way because sort of the soundscape of the book and the way that voices are described doesn't really stick out to me as much so that hadn't even occurred to me when I was first reading it but I like that a lot and I think in fairness anything said by a bunch of black riders outside your door would be pretty menacing so you know Probably, whatever actual yeah sound their voices have is somewhat immaterial i'm very glad that fatty bulger survived the experience yes he did his best yeah he, he doesn't deserve best. he doesn't deserve any of this bullshit he sees them he runs for the hills he's a good friend and he has done more than enough yes and he raises the horn call of buckland the fear fire foes awake awake 
And the mm. alarm bells that haven't been used in a hundred years are sounded. Yeah, which is which is kind of cool. Um, yeah. But also, it does show that, like, this evil that, it, this evil has expanded, this evil has seeped into the furthest reaches of the land where it, it shouldn't have been. Mm -hmm. The Shire should have been safe. But it's not anymore. And if the Shire is not safe, what are we all headed into as we're headed into the wild? Yeah. Anyway, back to Bree. <laughs> Woof. Okay. Um, yeah, things aren't much better over there. I mean, Aragorn did a good job keeping watch. Good for him because everybody's still alive. But then all the ponies are gone and the ponies had been doing so well up to this point And I was so worried. Ultimately, later in the chapter, we find out what happened. And they're okay. But as soon as I saw that, I just went, oh, no. But I love that, like he does like within a page or two. Revealed. Don't worry, the ponies are fine. Mm -hmm. he I'm knows sure there were. Be worried. I'm sure there were angry letters after the first one from pony lovers everywhere, going, "Please." Oh Which, no! I've been. I've. Side note: I've been on the internet a very long time, friends, and I am just so glad that pony lovers meant something different in the 30s than it does now, or did in like <laughs> 2014. I watched My Little Pony: Friendship Is Magic as it was coming out. And I was round about the target audience. I was a youngish teenage girl, and I just enjoyed the nice ponies. But then I was also on the internet, and it made it harder to enjoy the ponies. But these ponies, these uncorrupted, uncorruptible ponies are fine. And I'm glad that we're reassured about that, because I'm sure there was, there was whatever the equivalent of outrage. How, I don't know how outraged you can be. If you're some polite British person writing a letter to Professor Tolkien to express your strong concern for the welfare of the ponies, I'm sure that would be the most polite fan mail ever, even if you're complaining. <laughs> I, I was trying to figure out if I could make a joke about pony play in there and... Um... <laughs> Because I have also been on the internet for a long time. Um, so I'm familiar with what you speak of, but also I'm familiar with other things. <laughs> yeah, true. But, you know, we um, don't kink shame on this podcast. We king shame. We don't believe in monarchies, but. Absolutely not. People no. can do what they're going to do. The only as long kings... as it's not with the ponies from My Little Pony, please. No, the only monarchies we believe in are. Um, Ones in which there's a hot Star Wars nerd getting topped by a, a hotter American bisexual. I love that. Clearly um, that is inspired by some specific events. <laughs> anyway, read Red, White, and Royal Blue. <laughs> it's, it's a great amazing. book. Watch Anyways. the movie. Anyway. So the ponies, they assume for the moment are fucked and they were ready to head out super early in the morning. So the ponies were all packed and this has now really set back their plans. But Mary, always looking on the bright side, goes, well, if they can't leave early, at least we have time for breakfast. So they get some breakfast out of it. And Strider is so fucking pissed about this. He's like, we need to leave now. We like, it doesn't matter. The ponies aren't going to really help us on the roads. We're going to be going off road quite a bit. We might as well just walk. Mm -hmm. um, let's get going. And then it says it was like, it took them three hours. <laughs> God, they're they're me. I love that this is a, you know, on the one hand, an epic adventuring group. And on the other hand, it's entirely just a group of queer teens and queer 20-somethings who cannot get their shit together and i feel like there's a you know perhaps coming from a place of ignorance but still healthy sense of perspective going look three hours to eat breakfast is not going to make or break this adventure if it comes down to that tight of a time frame we're fucked anyway let's just eat the breakfast and that's an energy that i would like to bring to my own life 
Just eat the breakfast, friends. Yeah. It's the most important meal of the day. Apparently. I have recently come to the understanding that I love eating breakfast. I love breakfast food, but I hate cooking breakfast. I can't do it, especially on a work morning. And I love to cook. Both of us do. And we will cook things that are very ambitious and elaborate. But if it's a work day or I'm trying to get somewhere, I need the food. If I don't eat breakfast, I will have a bad day. But I just don't have time to cook it. So I've embraced going to the towniest Duncan of all the towny Duncans in my redacted town. And I love it so much. Isn't, uh, no offense, but your town is incredibly a towny town. Like, aren't all the Duncans towny Duncans? I mean, there's not that many in this town, but there's one that doesn't have a drive through So you have to physically go in. And the signs are still the physical paper signs up in the back. They're not the screens. So they have everything, you know, sometimes the daily specials are written out on a chalkboard, but all of the regular menu items are on paper. And it's staffed by a bunch of teenage girls, as is every business in this area, for better or worse. But instead of it being a weird, creepy harem where it's all these teenage girls and some middle-aged man just sort of watching them from the back, there is this lovely woman who is probably in like her mid-60s. She has the orangest spray tan, the yellowest blonde hair, the shortest shorts the heaviest roadie accent. She is the most beautiful soul in the world and I would die for her. Every day you go in and she will make time to chat with you and give you some compliment as if she has seen into your soul and found out what you needed to hear that day. I fucking love her. And I get to see her when I pick up my little bacon, egg and cheese or my little everything bagel bites. But yeah. It's a whole experience that I have to do because I know I'm not going to cook breakfast in the mornings. That's fair. I would love to embrace walking to Dunks more, but there are, there are listeners can't see me counting mentally on the map of, in my brain. I believe it's five Dunks within a mile radius of my workplace. Amazing. At least. Dunks um, is because the thing is it's not good but it is there you can count on it to be there yes Uh uh-huh anyway we live in the northeast (laughs) yes Um, if you couldn't tell um but you know what doesn't have a dunks middle earth brie yeah yeah um yet you're expanding the franchise. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh my God. But I do want to get I, back to the ponies. I do want to get back to the ponies. And I want to get back to Butterbur being so pissed that like he could not provide, you know, good and safe lodging and service to them. And he mm-hmm. he's so mad about it. Yeah. And he, you know, yells at the Southern travelers because, you know, one of their number was a horse thief and he's gone missing and looks more than half a goblin like Mm. i'm like do we have a half orc all of a sudden perhaps interesting um but they finally managed to pay for an obscenely expensive very malnutritioned mal a a very malnourished malnourished thank you um, this pony won't be prancing anytime soon. No, no. From Bill Fernie. Fuck Bill Fernie. And he is the source. I mean, he treated this pony so terribly and everyone can see it. And he extorts them for a stupid amount of money because he knows they need it. And he gets Sam to act up. I forget what the line was that prompts this, but he's saying some snide remark about them heading off with his really janky pony um but then sam's retort is 
you, Fernie, he said, put your ugly face out of sight or it will get hurt. And then he chucks an apple at him. So he is driven not only to insults, but to apple based violence, which is a lot for Sam because he just he cares about animals and he doesn't like people being mean to animals or being rude to him and his friends. And it was fantastic. It is. It's, it's he it, Bill Fernie goes, and you, Sammy, don't go ill treating my poor old pony pa, and spits at them. <laughs> <laughs> um and I wonder if Samwise Gamgee has a similar reaction to being called Sammy as I was you gonna do. say the same thing. Because you don't like people calling you Sammy. I don't like the vast majority of people calling me Sammy. Sammy is a very special nickname that I think I've counted six people on planet Earth are allowed to use. Anyone else? I don't care how well you know me. You don't know me that well. You can't call me Sam. You can call me Samantha. You can call me Sam if we're friends, if we're peers. But yeah, maybe this was just an overly presumptuous Sammy. And Sam Gamgee went, fuck it. Threw his apple. I support it. And hit Bill square on the nose. Good aim, buddy. Which, man, that's perfect. That was, I I have the note of just Sam throwing his apple at Bill Fernie. Mm-hmm. And I, I know we can't spend the entire time talking about horses because we are roughly half an hour into this and we're through like five lines of my notes. But just <laughs> for the peace of mind of the people at home, the original ponies, the we mentioned that they're fine. Specifically what happens to them is they get scared and they find Fatty Lumpkin, it's Tom Bombadil's horse, and then Tom takes care of them for a while and then they end up going back to the prancing pony and just kind of living their lives there and they end up having a lovely time so at least they have a happy ending and we don't have to worry about them and it said you know they had to work a good deal harder at the prancing pony than they did before uh in mm-hmm. the shire but it was fine it yeah. ended up being fine um and it was it was like they escaped the many dangers of the the lands beyond mm-hmm. which we will not escape the many dangers of the lands beyond we very quickly get Pippin still being opposed to shortcuts because shortcuts make long delays. Mm-hmm. And I love that that's a recurring theme. Um, which is fun. Interesting. So I was um, thinking about how a few episodes back we had talked about keeping an eye on the Tookish nature of the, of our Hobbit crew. Yes. And particularly of the one named Took. And also about the fact that he's a horrible teen. Mm -hmm. And yet, he's the one who has on multiple occasions been like, we're not taking a fucking shortcut. Mm -hmm. Why are we taking a shortcut? This is a bad idea. Um, I mean, I feel like that makes sense. Often teens feel and often rightly so that they're the only ones who know what's going on i mean i'm sure you remember being a teen and being around a bunch of adults who just cannot get their shit together and going if everyone only listened to me this would be fixed by now or we wouldn't be having this issue so i i feel like that's not off brand for a teen if there are any teens here hi we love you it, eventually you won't have to be a teen anymore and life gets somewhat better it it certainly does um I will say, though, this podcast, again, is tagged as explicit and for good reason. So if you are 18 or 19, then you're almost <laughs> out. Being a teen is almost done. Yes. Um, this is a podcast for adults. Yeah. Um, hmm. This is a podcast for adults. We've already talked about pony play on the show today <laughs> alone. <laughs> If you are at an age where your parents still have access to your browser history and you've been Googling pony play, listen, we are not, we here at the Phantom Apprentice are not responsible for any consequences that may be levied by parents onto teens as a result of things they Google because of listening to this show. That's, that's on you. You make your own choices, but we're not endorsing them and we're not responsible for them. Thank you for the disclaimer, Sam. You're welcome. Um, moving on from the ponies and the playing of the ponies and <laughs> the riding of the ponies and <laughs> anything related, uh, Sam is making a face at me. 
as I make a double entendre. Shortcuts make long delays, da, mm-hmm. da, 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 and we get to midwater the midgewater marshes. More midges than water, am I right? I, I thought that was a great joke. I appreciated that tremendously. There's a lot of jokes about the number of midges, which, yeah, I hate bugs. I would be complaining about the bugs, too. Yeah. How, I mean, to be fair, how terrible a place, like, how terrible would a place have to be for you to name it? Oh, yeah, this is, um, this is Mosquito Gulch. Gulch is just the worst. That sounds like a terrible onomatopoeia. And then to have that associated with mosquitoes, bleh, not going there. I also love at one point that the Neeker Breakers, as Sam calls mm-hmm. them, um, are evil relatives of the cricket. <laughs> and I love the idea that a cricket is capable of good and evil. I love that as well. And I think that my spouse, if they were here, would have some strong opinions on that because they are very averse to crickets or any cricket-like creatures because there are these bugs in Florida that I forget what they're called, but they're basically... They're not that. They're these huge fucking nasty, just enormous giant cricket things. And they are so horrible and so terrible that if you see one, anytime you see a small variation of a cricket, you just go... But... I like crickets. I actually found a cricket at the playground the other day with my baby. And I was very proud of myself because I caught it. And I was able to go up to her and go, hey, you want to see this bug? And all the other kids also wanted to see the bug. And I was very cool. Well, um, I'm Googling giant evil cricket Florida. Listen, it makes sense that Florida, of all the places in the U.S., is what's going to have a cricket with evil in its heart. They're called lubbers. L-U-B-B-E-R-S. Lubbers. They are... (laughs) <laughs> they have little mouths and faces. Yeah, I'm clicking away. I'm not I'm not going to send you pictures of these. Just trust me, they're really gross. We were packing up my apartment yesterday because we're moving in like 10 days. Mm-hmm. And we moved some things and there was not one, but two spiders. <gasps> no. Um, and our it was me, my roommate and our friend. And my friend, our friend and I are um, what one might call spider averse. One might. Yes. And so um, my roommate killed one and I saw another one running away and they were like, what do you mean? I have one in my hand. And I was like, absolutely the fuck not. And slammed it with a plastic bin. Good <laughs> job. So oh, the shiver down your spine. In the Midwater Marshes, back to evil bugs, but uh, in Middle Earth, Mm -hmm. we also see as they're uh, trudging through the, excuse me, trudging through the Midwater Marshes, that there was a light in the eastern sky that flashes and fades many times. Yeah, what's going on with that? I didn't see really any elaboration maybe there was more and i just missed it but i just wrote mysterious light in the sky question mark question mark that just happens well um well there is actually an explanation it's it's very yeah it's it's a little hard to catch Mm -hmm. um but they do make it to weathertop eventually um, it's seven days to Weathertop from Bree. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, um, as they're, they're making their way to Weathertop, um, we get our first song of the chapter. Yeah. With Sam singing about Gilgalad, who was an elven king. And he Um, learned about it from Bilbo, who also taught him how to read, which is so nice. Bilbo sounds like he's a great boss. Yeah, which it's it's really lovely. We get the song and then we talk about Mordor. I have one thing from right before that. Hit me. Um, So before that, um, I'll cut these ums. 
they're talking about how Frodo is getting skinny and he is tightening his belt and saying, very odd, said Frodo, tightening his belt, considering that there is actually a good deal less of me. I hope the thinning process will not go on indefinitely or I shall become a wraith. Do not speak of such things, said Strider quickly and with surprising earnestness. And that's concerning. I have just as a person in the world exposed to pop culture, heard the phrase ring wraith before. And I don't actually know anything about them or what it means. But now I'm worried that that's a thing he could become. Like if you're exposed to the ring for a long time, you turn into one and we're not supposed to talk about them. And so that was upsetting. I don't know if you want to reveal to me the nature of ring wraiths yet. We will actually be talking about ring wraiths this chapter. Okay, 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 cool, cool, cool. Um, the the ring wraiths, I mean, the ring wraiths are the riders. Okay, that makes sense. That's kind of what I thought, but I wasn't 100% sure. Right. Um, and so, we'll, we'll get to them a little more. We'll talk about them a little more as, as they come up. But I do want to talk about both sort of both Strider's aversion to discussing wraiths and also mm-hmm. Strider's aversion to discussing Mordor. Yeah. Right? Because this name aversion thing and the power of names has a long history in mythology and folklore. Hit me. Let's hear it. Right? So the power of the name, like, is such a huge thing in fantasy. You know, we see it in Earthsea. We see it in Tolkien. We see it in uh, The Name of the Wind, the King Killer Chronicles. We see it in um, The Inheritance Cycle. There's, we see it in there, The Jasmine Throne and in The Oleander Sword, two excellent books. There's a third one coming Yes, out. yeah. The power of... It, the true name um, and one's true name and the power of names. The Mormon church. (laughs) Oh my God. Well, I mean, well, and that traces back to uh, the old Testament, right? And the, the name of God Mm -hmm. and to utter the name of God was power. So powerful. And, and so, taboo that you couldn't utter the name of god you like it wasn't to be spoken yeah you know don't take the lord's name in vain it's not just the word god it's the name itself Mm -hmm. um and this happens in greek mythology it happens in uh egyptian mythology as well i believe i think it's uh, Isis discovers the name of uh, discovers Ra's name and has power over him because of that. Um, you have in uh, a lot of languages we have the word for bear. You you couldn't say bear, and so a lot of like old words for bear really just mean like the brown one. Because to speak the name of the bear was to invoke the bear, was to bring the bear about. Like the modern equivalent of not saying Alexa because you don't want to accidentally turn on the Alexa in someone's home. I don't have an Alexa in my home besides our good friend Alexa, who is always welcome in my home. But the creepy Amazon listening device, I do not have because I think it is very creepy. But when I've been working at the houses of people who have them, it's like, the faceless woman, the robot woman, you have to talk around it so as not to activate it. No, exactly. Exactly shit like that. And calling things like the Furies, the kindly ones, um, or the Fae, the fair folk. Mm -hmm. Right? Using a name, using a descriptive term is to call upon that thing. And so you have to couch what you're saying in euphemism um and so even even here far away from mordor invoking the name of mordor is to invoke the power of mordor Mm -hmm. is to invoke the evil and potentially bring it upon you when it's already seeking you out 
don't draw any more attention to yourself. Oh, hell, we forgot the biggest fucking one, which is um, the Turf series. Oh, yeah. I I specifically didn't bring it up because I thought, you know, we don't need to talk about the Turf series. But it was the first thing I thought of, and I'm sure was the first thing that many of us who are in a similar age bracket, aka the audience of this podcast, will think about because of the iconic line that I'm sure we all hear in Emma Watson's voice to this day. He who must not be named. Voldemort mm-hmm. right um so it's yeah it is something that we are all familiar with the power of a name so I just I like that that's found its way in here I like that it's found its way into so much of modern fantasy partly because it's here mm-hmm. and partly because it features in mythology so prominently I love it. Anyway, they do uh, make it unaccosted, unmolested to Weathertop. Mm -hmm. And they find evidence that Gandalf was there three days ago. And that he potentially was attacked and there's scorch marks around. So he fought people off. Mm -hmm. with magic and power and fire which he clearly we have we have history and evidence from both the hobbit and from earlier in this book that he has great mastery over fire and the magic of fire gee three days ago um we were in the marshes three days ago seeing Uh, strange lights in the sky oh oh that makes a lot of sense. They were watching Gandalf's battle. Damn. Oh, that's so good. Uh-huh. Is that like explicitly explained at any point or are you just a smart cookie who figured that out? Um, I don't remember if it's explicitly explained. It might be. Um, but I do believe there's actually a lion here somewhere that talks about Gandalf fighting and this, the scorch marks specifically. Well, yeah, I mean, I figure you can, I know that it is said that he was fighting and that's why he had to leave his message really subtly and quickly. And they could tell that he made it in a hurry. But I don't know if the characters ever make the connection to, Oh, those were those weird lights that we saw. Or if that's just on the reader to put two and two together. Yeah. I, I, I don't recall. Um, If we get more of that in the second half of this book, we might. Who knows? Well, I'll just go with the smart cookie theory for now because it's true. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, We're really talking a lot about time in this chapter. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot about like, we did this in the morning and this in the evening and this is where we were and it's been six days since we left and this was three days previously and um which is kind of interesting because we get such vague time frames in uh in the hobbit Mm -hmm. right you know we get like one morning early in may and then they arrive in the beginning of june somewhere so it takes but so i believe the the general consensus among tolkien fans is it takes the company 40 days in the hobbit to get from bag end to rivendell Mm -hmm. right and here it's been two weeks since they set out from Bag End. And they're supposed to have another two weeks to get to Rivendell. Which means they're making it 10 days quicker, roughly. Damn. Which is a fair amount of time when you're covering this ground by foot. Yeah, and they're a much smaller group, but they're still walking. Yeah, and they had ponies for some of it, but yeah, they are still walking. Um, but anyway, they get up to Weathertop and they see that uh, there's something in the distance coming for them. Five riders are coming after them. Ah. And so they fortify themselves in the Weathertop and wait. Mm-hmm. Basically, because they, they're like, this is the best place for it, I guess. 
we're gonna have to deal with them we might as well do it here and, and I we get that. oh sorry you go i love that you know in there's so many stories in which the the waiting is always the hardest part right mm-hmm. the it's the waiting for things to happen sitting in the trenches and this this is this is so going back to tolkien mm-hmm. in, and his like tolkien himself and his war experience because he was in the first world war he witnessed and participated in trench warfare and so where you get you know short periods where everyone's trying to kill you and there's lots of shelling and bombs and then so much waiting and that's what this is they're waiting for the danger they're waiting for shit to hit the fan Mm -hmm. and what do you do while you wait to die yeah i guess you try and be happy you tell stories right but tell stories (laughs) um and I didn't write down what this story was, but there was some story that Aragorn didn't want them to tell. And I just went, okay, great. Another thing that Strider doesn't want us to talk about. But then there is a story that he does agree to talk about. And I he know didn't this want is to one. Talk about, mm-hmm. He didn't want to talk about uh, Gilgalad again. Yeah. Because there's a whole piece where Gilgalad goes to Mordor. Ah. Uh, and he goes, he goes about Mordor. we're literally waiting for them to show up. Can we not? Yeah. Do this now. Not the time. Very reminiscent of one time when I was with my spouse in the ER and in the ER waiting room, they were playing these really gross medical dramas on the TV. And that is the most upsetting thing that you could possibly be watching in an emergency room is other people having pretend medical disasters that's the most stressful thing you could put on so i don't know what sick fuck decided that that was what they needed to put on in that er but you know just this is very much not the time or the place but then there is another story that aragorn does agree to tell and i know that we've talked about it on a previous episode at length but we can sum it up length yeah, it was maybe on, I think it might have been on one of the background or intro episodes that we may be re-recording at some point, but we have definitely discussed it, but we can discuss it again. Baron and Luthien. <sighs> BRB crying. The tale of star-crossed lovers. Um, so beautiful. We watched a whole video about how it related to Tolkien's real life. It's just like, oh. Well, and, and how the names Baron and Luthien are inscribed on the gravestones of him and his wife. Immortal love. Immortal love and love, love so powerful that one gives up immortality for it. Beautiful. Ugh. Heartbreaking. Wild. Um, and I don't, I don't have too much more. It's a very pretty poem. We get a very beautiful song that strider tells but then he says that's a song in a mode that is called anthanath among the elves and is hard to render in our common speech i love that tolkien is such a fucking nerd that he has multiple forms of elven poetry of course he does i mean this is this is like me translating you know iambic pentameter into another language and that doesn't necessarily flow the same way as English and being like, this is hard to do, but you know, I'm going to try it and still somehow managing to get the iambic pentameter. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I love that for Tolkien. Yeah. We, we know that this whole fucking story came out of him creating languages and then creating mythology. And of course, of course, of course he has different types of poetry for the elves they have their whole society why would they only have one type of poem oh yeah absolutely that makes total sense but i i just love that that makes me very very happy yeah and that lovely story um gives us a little bit of a reprieve before we find out that frodo can see the black riders when he puts the ring on and they are very scary and well 
we're not quite there. Yeah, is there um, more stuff in between? There, there's a teensy, teensy bit where they're talking about um, the the tale where Strider sort of breaks down the song. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to note a couple of lines as well. One line in particular. Yes. Which is an enemy of whom Sauron of Mordor was but a servant. And we've talked about in a previous episode, like how the power level is clearly rising here, Mm -hmm. right? Gandalf was all nonchalant about the dragon, but he's genuinely worried about Sauron and Mordor. And they refer to Sauron as the enemy with a capital E. And this other enemy is referred to as the great enemy, capital G, capital E. And this is a really interesting, like, fantasy and sci-fi trope. This is a post-apocalyptic world. I always forget that. No matter how great things seem, this is a post-apocalyptic world. The, the great magics and great civilizations of the past have fallen, but likewise, so have the great enemies. So no matter how terrifying everything seems, this pales in comparison to what once was. Mm-hmm. And that's really interesting to kind of keep in mind of like, it can always get worse, but it's going to get damn fucking bad. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Also, we learn like Elrond of Rivendell is of the line of Baron and Luthien. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Kings of Numenor as well, who we we will hear more about the Kings of Numenor as we go on. Because I was going to say, I don't know who they are. No, but it's it's interesting to sort of put into context who Elrond is, because we know Elrond's important and Elrond is, you know, a, a, a very important elf. But we don't necessarily have context for who Elrond is. But this is this is saying, you know, oh, yeah, Elrond, Elrond's grandfather was a son of Zeus. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's where we're putting Elrond in this uh, scenario here. Yeah. And also me with in this long intervening time, having binge listened to all five Hitchhiker's Guide audiobooks, uh, just want to go, Elrond's just this guy, you know? <laughs> um, but he's not but yeah, just this guy. Get... He's important. But then we have to roll for fucking initiative. Yeah. Um, and Frodo puts on the ring. Which he's been trying um, this whole time not to do and has been told not been to do. this whole time not to do, not to do. And prior to this, we've talked about the fact that the ring rates, um, which is what they are, don't see necessarily. Mm-hmm. But when Frodo puts on the ring, not only can he see the ring rates, they now seem to be able to see him. Yeah, he's like on their plane. And their eye, yeah, it can, it like puts you in the border ethereal plane, more or less. Um, and he gets stabbed by a blade of ice and falls, calling out the name of Elbereth, which we know from a previous episode, she's the queen of the Valar. Mm-hmm. She's a, a deity. But he ends up getting injured and drops down and starts making death saves, I guess. Yeah, um, let me refer to my notes, see if I had anything specific about that. Yeah, nothing specific until chapter 12. Basically, I stopped at, ah, they're very scary. They are very scary. We get not a, like, an extended description, but enough of one to know this is bad and we're in deep shit. Yeah. And then we get to chapter 12, Flight to the Ford. Do we want to move on to that? I think so. I am just referring to my copy of the text here, which I think has lost all of my highlights, which is fun. I have the quotes that I wrote down, but that's okay. I will continue on without it. So Frodo gets attacked and then passes out, basically. And he comes to and Sam is freaking out and starts accusing Aragorn of being a black rider. And Aragorn has to go, no, I have nothing to do with this. Please calm down, you strange little man. And 
Frodo is really badly injured. Clearly the Black Riders are under the impression that this is a fatal wound and they back off a little bit. But the thing that really stuck with me out of this whole sort of coming to scene is they find this knife, which is clearly some kind of D and D magic item slash JFK conspiracy theory, ice weapon, because it just, you simply must elaborate on that. I, and I simply will. I am so glad that you, your curiosity has been piqued, but basically it is radiating this cold energy and it kind of melts when they pick it up. And one of the more, fringe jfk conspiracy theories is that the bullet that killed him was an ice bullet and it melted and that's why weird stuff happened there was it was part of a mythbusters episode about the assassination and they tried to recreate it and obviously it didn't work because of course a bullet made of ice doesn't work but i thought maybe this is something it melts and it goes away so you can't find the weapon and there's ice powers but then I think it reconstitutes itself because they keep looking at the knife and keep inspecting it later so it's this very they keep looking at the hilt okay so the blade goes away that was the not entirely does clear to be me. gone the blade is gone as far as it seems yes yeah so it's a um, one time use stab them fuck them up with ice powers kind of situation right whether it, well, whether it's ice or whether it's something else, cold and evil. It feels um, cold. It's icy enough. Yeah. Again, though, I, w- I do want to touch the power of names. More deadly to him was the name of Elbereth. Mm. Right? Names have power to speak the name is to invoke the thing itself. And I can't believe we didn't talk about this earlier it's just percolating through my brain filter now tom bombadil they summon him by singing a little song with his name in it exactly yes are we on law three or are we on law four of our laws of uh, fantasy i feel like a bad podcast host because i don't remember which law is which i think we might be getting on to our fourth law i think we have three because we, we have the, movie. we have magic makes you dramatic, plot happens in taverns. And I'm trying to find in my notes if I have a third law somewhere. Hey, um, listeners, if we have a third law that you have just, that you are currently aware of, you want to hit it, hit us with it at uh, the fandom apprentice at gmail.com or <laughs> at fan app pod on any of our social media. Cool. So Thanks. I think I think what you may be thinking of, according to notes from May in our super secret Discord that's only for the two of us, is we have the first law, magic makes you dramatic, but then there's a corollary to the first law, which is like the amount three of corollaries to the first law. <laughs> there's only one them. corollary written down at that time, which is that the amount of drama produced is directly correlated with the level of magical ability or power possessed by the individual. And then the second law is if there is a tavern, there would be plot. Oh, you know, I think there was a third law that was me predicting things. Had It might have been Sam related. I feel like there might be a third one, but I'm not sure. Mm. Well, now that we've done that, the fourth law is that, which is very much more a serious law, is that names have power. Yes. Um, The fourth law of fantasy is that names have power. Anyway, moving on, we had best remember that rangers are a half caster class. Mm -hmm. Because Strider does some little like magical chant and brews some healing herbs. Uh, Athalas herb, which is what, what, what helps Frodo a little bit. And I knew I knew that name from somewhere. Listeners, I ran a one shot like over a year ago entitled the library of athalas which was amazing i thought i was so fucking clever and i had made that shit up out out of concocting a bunch of syllables but no i pulled it from my subconscious apparently (laughs) Um, (laughs) there is nothing new under the sun and dms create nothing new we steal everything but you create new journeys and new experiences and that's what being human is about 
So I think I think it's still valid, but also you're correct. And I love A, that this herb that he finds has an effect on the rest of the party, just smelling it and the vapor or whatever in the air kind of perks everybody up, which is cool. They it's got obvi- the vapors. <laughs> it's obviously extremely powerful, which goes to show how fucked up. I'm going to say the correct hobbit. Frodo, not Bilbo, <laughs> which is what I was about to say. But then I caught myself. It shows how fucked up Frodo is and how bad his wound is that this doesn't completely fix it. It just makes it a little bit better. Somehow, and, I think we need to keep a running counter of how many times we fuck up and say the wrong Hobbit. Yeah, it's going to keep happening. I'm sure, it's sure going to keep will. happening. Uh, we're going to be still saying Bilbo when we mean Frodo all the way through Return of the King. So I think we just need to keep a running counter somewhere. We should get one of those little clicker thingies. But anyway, there's that, which I thought was cool. But also, I just love the tenderness. I love seeing people taking care of each other. I know that we have had many discussions about Hobbit genders and Hobbit masculinity. And so I don't really fully feel confident saying men taking care of each other. But, you know, effectively, yeah. And it's nice to see. Obviously, it's this you know, battlefield medicine. It's not like they're lovingly caressing each other in front of a fireplace, but it's still nice. It's still gentle. It's still this nurturing, caretaking moment between them. And I thought it was a sweet little moment in the midst of all the nastiness. There is a fire, even if it's just a campfire. Anyway, they he is doing better, but not great. And they put him on the pony. The next Who's morning. also doing better, uh, which really goes to show how bad its life was before. Well, he's doing better, but Frodo's doing worse. So either he's doing better because Bill Fernie was so bad, or he's doing better because he's evil and he's stealing Frodo's life force. This is a fascinating theory. Please expand on it. <laughs> Listen, if crickets can be evil, then so can ponies. <laughs> I mean, thinking back to my recent Douglas Adams adventures, there is an entire Hitchhiker's Guidebook that's all about the evil planet of Cricket and the people who live on it. And granted, it's talking more about the Cricket sport, but their entire thing is that they want to eradicate all life in the universe that isn't them. And they lived this very peaceful, charmed existence until they went out into the universe and discovered there was other life forms and went, well, we can't have that. Now, can we? And became this single-minded, bloodthirsty society just intent on destroying everything because they hated them. But they were called Cricket. So I think it can be connected. And I hear Crickets chirping outside because it's the summertime. So they're listening, maybe. The Crickets are also very merciful and good creatures crickets outside my window make sure you hear that part i will leave some snacks out for the crickets i don't feed crickets to my lizard i only feed her super worms crickets so you know just for the cricket uprising i'm earning us some points it's like you leave a bowl of milk out for the house hob and leave some snacks out for the crickets yeah you know I have no fucking idea what crickets eat. Not a clue. But anyway. But I'm not that kind of biologist. They get going again. Put Frodo on the pony. Pony's doing better. And then I just wrote, lots of trudging for a while. Nothing much happens until they go to a bridge and find this green stone. Did you have anything to say about the trudging? Well, we do uh, have... There is another corollary to that first law, which was um, mag- magic is dramatic, but it's that magical characters speak firstly in service to the plot. Yes, yes. Right. And so Strider being a low level magical character, like he clearly has some attachment to magic mm-hmm. of some kind. But he is clearly not at the level of the elves that we've seen or of Gandalf, obviously. So 
with the first corollary being that the level of drama is directly connected to the level of magic, I would say that the first corollary can also be connected to the second corollary being that magical characters speak firstly in service to the plot. And so the level of plot relevance of magical characters speaking can also be correlated to their magical ability. I like it. So in it. this case, he's giving exposition. He is just kind of giving world building as we wander through. He's giving little tidbits about the areas they're walking through, which is great. I love that. I love that Tolkien went, I'm going to put in this character that knows his way around so I can talk about my map that I drew. And just the delighted look on your face as you are embodying this Tolkien moment, I'm sure that is exactly how he felt. Just being like, oh, hee hee, I can tell everybody. But I'm going to tell everybody about my OCs. This is my book. <laughs> <laughs> this is my original character. Do not steal. Listen, the amount of times that I have put uh, NPCs in my D&D games so I can tell my players about sh fun shit that I've made up, uh, the limit does not exist. It's great. Exactly. It's, a, it's the best thing to do. But they find this stone on the bridge. Yes. Which means someone came before them and said... This is fine. You can pass. It's safe to pass. Yeah. And then I have one other note from sort of this page, which is all of a sudden we have Pippin's full name. Oh, interesting. I didn't pay attention to that. It's, we have, where did you learn such tales if all the land is empty and forgetful? Asked Peregrine. The birds and beasts do not tell tales of that sort. Because Strider has mentioned that, you know, the tales were so long ago that the hills have forgotten them, though a shadow still lies on the land. And I'm going to put on my archaeology hat for a second. Yes, please do. Um, we are over an hour into this podcast. I love it. So when you wander around a territory that has been inhabited by humans for a long time, you can often see the results of that in the land, even if there are no people there any longer. Right? And I am not skilled enough to do this, but I have walked around with archaeologists who are. Mm -hmm. And they'll point out like, oh, you can tell by the way this hill is, there was once either a road here or part of a wall. Like here we see a line of stones. This was definitely part of a fort. Like you can, it, people who are skilled at reading what the land tells you and the effects that people have on the land can tell that you can, there are things that the land can tell you, stories the land can tell you. And if we're finding caches, uh, you know, troll caves and things, you that tells you stories. The artifacts that people leave behind tell you stories. There is also, Peregrine took, immortal beings in this world <laughs> that are still wandering around <laughs> and that Strider admits to knowing he has spent time in Rivendell with elves. He speaks elvish. There are people who are thousands of years old. He's a friend of Gandalf's. Like, on the one hand, yes, he can read the land. I'm sure he has seen a great many things. But also, there are books and things written down by these immortal people. Yeah, I can just go ask my buddy the next time we meet up for drinks to smoke our pipe weed and watch fireworks. Hey, you remember that thing from 2000 years ago? Oh, yeah, totally. I was there with my other buddy. Yeah, you could just find that out from a firsthand source. Yeah. So uh, Peregrine took, that is how Strider learned the tales of such things. <laughs> That's like when kids are like, you were born in the 1900s? <laughs> so yes, like, shut up. Like, yeah, it wasn't that long ago. I was there. It's fine. Anyway, we get more wandering and Frodo deteriorating. Mm -hmm. To the point where he can't use his left arm anymore. It's His left arm is basically dead. Yes. And... Strider is basically being like, listen, I can't do anything. We just have to get going and we have to get to Rivendell. Mm -hmm. 
and we have to do this now. Um, you know, I'm trying to take us off the road, but we're going to have to go back to it to get across the ford and get, get across the river. And then they find trolls. Pippet's freaking out about the trolls. Yeah, and I was thinking, oh, there's trolls. There's three trolls. This is just like in The Hobbit. And then we find out it is literally the same three trolls from The Hobbit because they got turned into stone and never moved because they're still stone. And Strider goes, Pippin, did you forget everything you have ever learned about trolls? That it's literally noon. (laughs) Yeah. Look, this one has a bird's nest behind its ear. Do you think this is going to eat you anytime soon? And this is the ninth day since Weathertop when they find the trolls. So Frodo has been getting sicker and sicker for over a week now. Uh... But don't worry, because we have a lovely little song from Sam. That he made up all by himself. That's really clever and fun. And it's about a or... troll gnawing on this guy's bone. It's, or it's... It... He dug something out of his memory. These old images here brought it to my mind. Well, yeah, I think at some point, if my super cool source is working, I think it does say that he came up with it. Oh, it's out of his own head, of course. Yeah. Where did you come by that, Sam? Asked Pippin. I've never heard those words before. Sam muttered something inaudible. It's out of his own head, of course, said Frodo. I'm learning a lot about Sam Gamgee on this journey. He's a humble he king. Now he's a jester. He'll end up beca- he'll end up by becoming a wizard or, or a warrior. I hope not, said Sam. Um, he has depths. He has hobbies. He, he likes to come up with his little songs. He has many depths. I do desperately I, I was trying so hard earlier to figure out a good joke uh with the bone he boned from its owner. Mm-hmm. Um so listeners Email us your best joke or pun about troll dicks. Uh, we also get the phrase <laughs> troll hole. There's a lot you can do with troll hole. Troll And hole, also troll a lot of jokes you can make about it. But, yes. Uh, so I will take your best jokes about troll sex. Um, <laughs> at Goongus. <laughs> we really should like ask him and give him a heads up if we're going to keep... <laughs> Invoking his name like this. <laughs> invoking the power of his name. <laughs> Names have power and Gungus has power. That's Gungus um, with zeros instead of O's. <laughs> I would say it's on Twitter.com, but it's not even Twitter anymore. It's X or whatever. Also, if you figure out how to pronounce tweet now, email that to us as well. Exit. <laughs> I always um, think of it as Zeet. But Zeet. that might be wrong. You can date when we recorded these episodes by how we talk about our social media. Yeah. So now the bone he boned from its owner. I- and speaking of things and mm. their owners and sort of the chain of the chain of custody. There we go. So like, what was the forensics thing? Chain of custody. Um, they once they remember everything that they've ever learned about trolls, we learn that Frodo wasn't entirely sure if the troll story was true so this is an interesting moment for him to really be confronted with the fact that yeah Bilbo did do a lot of shit he probably did all of the shit that he says he did and you know I think that's something that all people that's a phase that all people go through as we grow up when we realize that our parents and caregivers are also people who have had their own lives and their own experiences before us. And so not only has his uncle slash cousin, I think I forget how they're actually related. Not only has this person who has helped him in his growing up had his own whole life before Frodo, he did a lot of really dope stuff and it's cool to see that. And also the others are talking about all of the treasure that was in the cave. And Frodo says that Bilbo gave all of his troll treasure away because he felt like it wasn't really his since it came from robbers. And I thought that was a very nice sentiment. And then I was thinking about all the treasure that he got from smog. And I was like, well, wasn't that stolen? It was stolen from the dwarves mostly. And the dwarves gave it back to him. And so I think at that point it all kind of came out in the wash and it was okay. 
I think, you know, you could consider, yes, there was a lot of like Lake Town treasure that was stolen in there too. A lot of stuff from the Kingdom of Dale. But the idea being that Frodo didn't even take close Frodo, Bilbo. <laughs> this time I did it in reverse. Fuck. <laughs> Click. Um, this time, so Bilbo didn't even take close to one fourteenth of the treasure that he was promised. Mm-hmm. And so you could then say, you could then make the argument that all the treasure that he took was dwarf treasure, was formerly dwarf treasure given to him by the dwarves. And you could hope that following Thor and Oakenshield's death and the Battle of the Five Armies, that uh, Dane and the, the new king under the mountain would have returned the treasure to Dale, any treasure to Dale that belonged to Dale, such that Bilbo had only taken his fair share. There was nothing that he had that had come, he had come about. I would, I, I was about to say that he had come about dishonestly and then remembered his whole job description was burglar. So never mind, and let's move on. <laughs> There's no ethical consumption under dragon. But <laughs> yeah, but I thought that was a nice sentiment, especially for a British man in the 30s or, you know, did this one also come out in the 30s or was that just The Hobbit? No, that was just The Hobbit. The Hobbit came out in 1937. Well, still, for a British man in the past to go, hey, stolen shit, shouldn't keep it. That's a good sentiment. That's a good thing. I was pleased by that. Now and- apply that to the British Museum. <laughs> And then we get some blonde pretty boy on a horse. And I was really hoping it would be Legolas because that's a name that I know. And I have seen his face on a friend's childhood bedroom wall poster and just kind of looked at him and gone, yeah, I can see you spending a lot of time staring up at that face, having a lot of feelings about yourself. (laughs) Well, um, it's not Legolas. And he gets off his horse with the phrase, which means at last Dunedain or at last Ranger. Well met. Um, this is the elf lord Glorfindel. Mm-hmm. Which is not really a name that we have any context for. But in Tolkien's Legendarium, which of course was not published at this time, uh, but Glorfindel is a big character in the rest of the Legendarium. Mm -hmm. Glorfindel is thousands of years old and a powerful warrior. This is like telling a story about King Arthur or Joan of Arc that like takes place in the Middle Ages and then going, oh yeah, and then Hercules showed up. Damn. And then the random stranger you're traveling with be like, oh yeah, this is Hercules. He, um, he's from Athens. Don't worry about it. And you just don't get context there. And then somehow years later, you're like, wait a minute, this guy's a son of a God. Mm -hmm. And he did all of these labors. And like, he's a great hero. That's, that's what this is basically like. We won't get into, you know, everything about him in case we decide to eventually like read the Silmarillion or go on from here. But he's friends with Gandalf. He killed an essentially unkillable enemy during that great war that was previously mentioned by Strider. Mm -hmm. Uh, He lost his knife at one point, and there's a theory that the knife he lost is actually Sting, Bilbo's sword. Ooh, interesting. Uh, In early drafts, he's part of the Fellowship. Um, He is not to be fucked with. Clearly. He died. He died at one point, and then the gods sent him back like a thousand years later um basically like and then when they sent him back they made him stronger basically awesome. being like bitch you're not done yet we need you again yeah we had fun partying with you for a thousand years here's some more stuff just go fix some more problems yeah and that was literally thousands of years ago when they sent him back so <laughs> he got to spend a few thousand years around a thousand years dead and then he's been back for several thousand years he's just it's mm, He's terrifying. And Bilbo is just like, oh, hello. Nice to meet you. Not Bilbo. Fuck. (laughs) Frodo. (laughs) 
anyway, that's Glorfindel. I hope that helps you like make the best rest of this chapter just that much better. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Uh, this is absolutely the level 20 character that the DM has placed in, in the scene. Um, and you won't know it's the level 20 character unless it has it becomes relevant. It's great. I love him. He's lots of fun. He has still only seen five Black Riders, and he does note that, but he does mention that there are nine. Okay, so when he's talking about the nine, he means nine Black Riders, because I was a little confused about that. Yes. Uh, he mentions that three of the servants of the Sauron were on the bridge, but they withdrew. Um, I came upon two others. Where the other four may be, I do not know. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So he is he is referring to the nine Black Riders. And I will remind you of a line that we've encountered before. Nine rings, nine for mortal men, doomed oh, to die. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so that was fun. Um, he was the one who left the barrel stone on the bridge to let them know it was safe. And he does some light healing magic on Frodo to help him a bit. He can't cure him, but he helps a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, gives them a magic elf drink that doesn't taste like anything, but makes them stronger. Very cool. And then says, hey, I can see some evil shit on this magic evil knife that stabbed him. Let me cast Identify real quick. Yeah, we need to go. We need to go right the fuck now. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And to go right the fuck now, he puts Frodo on his horse and gives the horse instructions being like get him out of here basically and it is running and Frodo is trying to hang on with his one good arm and I don't have a lot of horse experience I don't know if I've talked about this specific recent horse experience on the podcast I feel like I might have but I was recently in Shenandoah with my family and we went on this trail ride And it was really nice and really beautiful. And anyone who knows anything about horses knows that the horses they use for trail rides are basically sofas with legs. They are not going to give you any problems. (laughs) They're going to be pretty comfortable to ride. They don't really care whether you're there or not. They've walked that same path three times a day, every day for the last however many years. You know, they're going on autopilot. You don't need to know anything about horses. You don't need to have a special spirit bond with the horse for it to just take you where you want to go. It's very straightforward. I have a healthy fear of horses, I think. The correct amount of fear that one should have for such a large animal. And I was riding with my spouse and my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law, who are all very, very experienced riders. And they were chatting with our guide. And it was just the however many of us, I guess the five of us total. And the guy could tell that most of us really knew what we were doing. And so he went, do you want to trot for a second? So I think that's how it goes is walk, trot, canter. So trot's the middle one. And that's just a moderate, slightly fast horse walking. That should be no big deal. And he said, you know, we're only going to do it for a minute. Are you okay with it to me? Because I was the least experienced rider. And I went, yeah, you know, if you think that it's fine and everyone else thinks that it's fine and I can do it, I'm sure I can do it. And I'm sure from the outside, objectively, it was very silly because this horse was just kind of jogging at a slow, moderate pace for about 30 (laughs) seconds. And I was screaming, like, actually very loudly, very afraid, because in that moment, you realize how not attached to the horse you are and how you could just fly off at any moment. But you are attached enough that if the horse suddenly fell sideways, you would go with it. If something bad happens to this horse, it's also happening to you. But something bad could happen to you without it happening to the horse. And it was very frightening. And it literally lasted less than a minute. And then it was over. But yeah, so for me having that brief experience and feeling like I was going to die, I could not imagine being on a horse that is actually galloping away from danger with a serious injury holding on for dear life. Like that well, has to horse, be very intense. Well, but they cover 20 miles before he sends the horse into a full gallop. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause they covered 20 miles in the day with the full party still. Yeah. They said, and then then they roll initiative because Glorfindel looks down the path and he goes, oh, fuck. Yeah. Run. 
And that, that's when he gives the, uh, Asphaloth, the horse, the command, Nora Lim, which in Elvish means ride swift or ride quickly. Mm-hmm. And that's when we get all nine black riders. So scary, so fucked up. Uh, sh- shit's going bad. You know, Frodo gets to the other side of the river and summons his courage and he can't go any further. And he summons his courage and he tells them to go back to Mordor. And they're like, hey, hey, buddy, come with us. Huh? You want to come along? Mm-hmm. It's fun. We have cookies. Come to the dark side. <laughs> and Frodo invokes the names of Elvareth and uh, Queen of the Valar and Luthien of the Baron and Luthien tale. Um, as a way of trying to get out of this, but the the Black Riders are struggling forward. And then the river rises up and washes them out. Yeah. And that is the end of book one of Fellowship of the Ring. That's a serious fucking cliffhanger. Um, yeah, so if you're reading along with us, the... It is a, the Lord of the Rings trilogy is in fact divided into six books, each of the volumes of Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, and Return of the King are divided into two books each. So we are now at the end of book one of Fellowship of the Ring. So Sammy, any thoughts that you want to bring back up from the first half of Fellowship? God, let's see. Let's look at my previous notes back from the first half. I mean, everything has just picked up so intensely. The stakes are higher. We're going further distances. We're dealing with more intense things. Just scrolling back and looking at, oh, Farmer Maggot's dogs. That's nice. Picking some mushrooms. How pleasant. You know, we really get settled and established in this nice, peaceful world. And then shit hits the fan real quick. And I, I love that. I, I like that Tolkien took the time to let us know that this world was calm and this world was kind and this world was peaceful and it is not any longer and it will not be if we don't do anything about it. And I think the other thing that is, especially in these chapters, really sticking out is he's conveying how much it sucks to go on this journey. I think, I don't know if I would say more so than in The Hobbit, but definitely just as well as in The Hobbit, in that there's bugs and you get tired and you run out of food. And I remember when I first started reading the Tamara Pierce Wild Magic books, that was something I noticed was those were the first books I had read where the elements and nature affected the epic journeys in a really realistic way because I think in a lot of YA and middle grade stuff it's just we go on a journey through the forest and it's great and awesome and magical and we're so cool and powerful and we don't have to worry about it but then being confronted with the realities of yeah there's mud and there's bugs and we're all itchy because we're covered in bug bites and some of our food spoiled and just these mundane things that you still have to deal with while you're on this epic quest which, of course, you know, like we were talking about before, I think ties directly back to his military experience. It just really makes it feel more grounded. And so you have all of these normal daily experiences happening mm-hmm. simultaneously with all of the grand magic shit. Well, and Frodo doesn't want to be on this quest at all. Mm-hmm. You know, there's that, that quote from earlier, which is, I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Yeah. Yeah, Frodo doesn't want to be here. Uh, He wants to be back in his little hobbit hole in Bag End. Or, hell, he'd be happy in Crick Hollow. He just wants to read some poetry and tend to his garden and live his life, and slowly seduce his gardener. Um, (laughs) But here he is. He's got the quest on him, and he's he's got the ring, and he needs to do something with it. So he's going to do something with it. Anyway, I love this fucking book. Yeah, no, it rules. 
I I love the first half of Fellowship. I you know, I think so many people will tell you that it drags, you know, because they're so used to like a story in which you get the big epic quest and then you go off on the big epic quest and then that's it. Mm-hmm. But this is such an important part of that big epic quest. This is, yeah, the hero's journey is a little extended here. But I, I think this contextualizes it really well. And on the one hand, we're operating on the hero's journey idea, right? The hero's journey circle. Um, what's the word I'm thinking thinking of? The the story framework. Yeah. No, something like that. I know what you mean. Thank you. But we're also operating on Tolkien's literary background, which would have been as Britain's foremost Beowulf scholar and having read the sagas and the Eddas and having started out his life as a classic scholar. And so being familiar with the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Aeneid um, and various other texts, things like the Epic of Gilgamesh, a lot of these old epic poems and epic stories have these super long exposition pieces, right? Because you can't necessarily expect that all of your audience, which has been told these stories through oral tradition, is familiar with the exact same versions, right? You have to orient your audience to the framework of the tale you're operating in. Mm -hmm. And Tolkien has built this world and his legendarium such that it functions in the same way. We see all of these stories and songs that people are telling each other. And so clearly there, there's a strong oral tradition. And we know that Bilbo has written down some of, excuse me, his own travels. So we know that we're starting to get, you know, some epic stories in the vein of things like the Aeneid and the Odyssey and the Iliad. So to keep it in that vibe, you need to have a little bit of that long exposition and that orient your reader, orient your listener to the world vibe. Yeah. And I think that this is one of those times where me being a first time reader is really serving me in this regard, because I don't feel like it's dragging at all. I have nothing to compare it to. I'm not reading this introductory bit and going, oh, this is fine, but it's not as cool as the big awesome stuff that happens later. You know, this is the big awesome stuff. My expectations for what will happen are growing as the story grows. So I'm just along for the ride and I'm just enjoying it. But yeah, I really don't feel impatient for more to happen because everything that happens is such a big deal. You know, they've Mm -hmm. been in over their heads since the moment they walked out the door So anything that happens is the stakes constantly raising. So I can see how for some people it might not be their cup of tea, but it is my cup of tea and I am enjoying it tremendously. Wow. Listeners, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this first half of Fellowship of the Ring. We have five more books to go, um, two and a half more volumes of Lord of the Rings before we come to a conclusion of of Tolkien's great epic tale. Thank you so much for coming along with us and we hope you continue. I I'm signing off. Sam, do we have anything else? Nothing relevant to the story. I'm just excited to meet our listeners because now that we have our plans for the next couple of months, we had a big production meeting because we're fancy and we have meetings. We have a whole action plan of when stuff is going to be released. And by the time you're hearing this, then obviously the things are out in the world. But I'm excited to meet you. I'm excited to meet your ears and hear your opinions. It's going to be really cool. Things are coming together at this point. Yeah. So, you know, if you know us in person, you can always deliver us your opinions 
in person. Um, if you are in our families and listening to this podcast, why please don't, don't tell us that you are. If, if you're here, the please just delete it. Don't. You don't need to be here. No. We um, don't have the time to edit clean versions of these podcasts for you. If, if I made the clean version of this show for my family, we'd edit out all the swear words. <laughs> like, Yeah, and we're not fucking doing that. No. Well... If you're still sticking with us as we we have our intro tangents and our outro tangents and our midpoint tangents, and, uh, thank you so much for sticking with us. We love you all very dearly. We're very glad you're here. We're very glad you're sticking with us. And we very much look forward to getting into the great and epic adventure. And in the meantime, where can people hit us up? We've already mentioned our pretend Twitter or Zeter, Geeter, whatever the fuck it's called now, and our real email. What's our other stuff? Like we said, our real email is thefandomapprentice at gmail.com. It's just our whole name spelled out. And all of our other social media is at fanapppod at, I was about to say at gmail.com. Um, <laughs> that would be a long and confusing username. No, Yeah. So at Fanapp Pod on Instagram and TikTok and currently Twitter. And if I choose to make something else for us, which I probably won't, we'll let you know. But you can find us on all those platforms and feel free to hit us up and interact with us and let us know what you think. And please uh, rate us if you are on a platform that allows ratings. It's a great way for other people to find the podcast. But the best way for other people to find the podcast is word of mouth. Tell your friends. uh, Force your friends to listen to the podcast in the car with you on your Mm -hmm. carpooled commutes. Share a share an earbud on your on your uh, on the bus with a friend. Airdrop the link to strangers. (laughs) Yes, that's definitely a great way to do things. No, I don't want that to be our (laughs) reputation. Get creative, no, no. though. Rent one of those airplanes that can drag a banner across the sky. The Fandom Apprentice. Two nerds, two bisexuals talking about Lord of the Rings. Um, We're about to meet a whole lot of hot people, and yes. I'm not going to be normal about it. No, I'm not either. I'm very excited. So, uh, if you're interested in us being not normal about a whole lot of hot people... Join us next time. And until then, have a lovely, lovely week, a lovely night, a lovely day, wherever you are. We love you very much. See you next time. time. The Phantom Apprentice is produced and edited by Rin and Sam. Our music was composed and performed by James, and our art is by Casey Turgeon. This podcast is created for non-commercial entertainment purposes, and the opinions expressed therein are our own and are not reflected with the opinions of any other person or organization. The content discussed is the property of the Tolkien Estate and is used here under fair use. Mm-hmm.